for the April uh, Disadvantaged Business and Workforce Advisory Committee for the Green Line Extension part of the project. Um, thank you um, to committee members and to alternates uh, for taking the time to be here today. Um, I know we have a full agenda today, um, as always. Um, so, um, uh, want us to uh, get started. Um, this is uh, my uh, interim co-chair's second meeting. So he's a pro now. He's he's all all worked in. He's 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 a pro. He's he's got no learning curve is is already already there. But again, another welcome uh, to Scott Butel from uh, Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Um, for those of you who may not have been at the last meeting, um, I wanted to definitely uh, introduce him as well. Um, oh, go ahead. I just said thank you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not going to um, read my little spill about COVID, um, although we will be having a conversation uh, later in the agenda relative to um, how we move forward um, with our meetings. Um, but uh, just as an information uh, only purposes, the council um, will be going back to in-person uh, public meetings for council and standing committees um, on April 25th, um, and us as council employees um, uh, have started to uh, return back to the office either in a hybrid state or, or full-time um, going back to the 18th. So that said, um, also I will go, go through our house, housekeeping um, items. Please uh, mute yourself if you're not speaking. If you are having technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat and we'll try and help you resolve them. Please close any other teleconferencing um, apps that you have or may have had open from other meetings. Um, and this meeting is being recorded by the Met Council. Uh, meeting handouts um, and presentations are posted on the project website um, and uh, can be accessed there. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott to conduct the roll call. All right, thanks. So I will just go through the roll call quick. And if you are here, if you can just say so. Um, and I will, I think, only read the alternates if uh, if the, uh, the member is not here, if that's OK with folks, just to expedite things. So. Um, just going to mark my, myself here, Shanti here, and Elaine here, since I know we're all here. Um, so first member, um, Barry Davies. Looks like a no. In that case, is the alternate Jenny Winkler here? Looks like a no as well. Gilbert, are you here? Yes, I am, Scott. Great, thank you. Um, is uh, Barb Lau here? No, she is not, but I can recron him here as her alternate. Okay, great, thank you. Um, is uh, Marvin Smith here? I am. Great, thank you. Um, Sheila Olson? No. Um, is uh, Christine Bronson here? Take that as a no. Julie Brecky? Good afternoon, I'm here. Thank you. Is Tony O'Brien here? I am, good afternoon. Great. You. Alex Merritt, are you here? Great, thank you. Leslie Woley? Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. It's like, no. Is uh, Daniel Peterson here instead? Um. 
Let's do, uh, Mara Brown. Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you. John O'Fallon. I saw you here somewhere. I'm present. Thank you. Thanks, John. Mary Schmidt. Is uh, Sheila Cowpey here? Sheila Cowpey is here. Great. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Just taking my notes here. And then uh, for presenters, go through here real quick as well. Is uh, Thomas Scott here? Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you. And Sheila, I see that you are now here. Thanks. Is uh, Nick Dial here? Yeah, that's Nick. Okay, thanks. Uh, is uh, Dave Davies here? Looks like he is not. I, I am here. Yep. Oh, you are here. Great. Thanks. Yeah, Lucio, are you here? Looks like you're here. Yep, I'm here, Scott. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Um, Dale Evan? Dale will not be today. Okay, no problem. Krista, I know you're here. Yep. Katie Mouse? Here today? Yes, I'm here. Great, thank you. Michael Tony. Yep, present. Great, right. thank you. Chris Cannon? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Brian Leitch? Uh, Brian Leach is not on, but Monica Robinson is. Oh, great. Thank you. And apologies for mispronouncing folks' last names. And uh, Eli, or, are you here? So, so. Yeah, I'm here. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Let me just uh, update my note about Sheila. Good to go. All right. So that is the roll call. So, um, now we will do the review of the March twenty uh, of the March twenty twenty two meeting minutes. So the minutes were included in the handout for the review. If you there are any edits, please let us know now for staff to capture, or you can email them to the the co chairs, and we can make those fixes. Were there any any edits folks had to those meeting minutes? Awesome. Well, hearing none, I will turn it over for the uh, Building Strong Communities update. We have the slide. All right, so now let's see if there's, are you able to increase that at all? Or well, let's see, I think I can increase it on my, my screen here. Um, so this is what the slide that I um, submitted our last meeting, this is kind of gives you a snapshot of uh, where we started our um, Building Strong Communities program with 43 participants, 81% um, of our uh, target goal of women, um, people of color and veterans. Uh, spread across um, 15 different trades. It was eight weeks of virtual construction training um, administered in partnership with North Hennepin Community College. We did four weeks of emotional intelligence training uh, with our partners, Twin Cities Rise. Um, we have done site tours of that first one was, well, actually that was an event with the Southwest LRT joint venture, a speed education where we bought a uh, our participants and a bunch of contractors together on March 29th um, to just expose them to the industry, um, both contractors and union officials. And then right now we are in our four weeks of hands-on training at the different training uh, centers and going through site visits. Um, and then once we complete that through May and June, we will do apprenticeship placement and support and continue to support their apprenticeships throughout the first year of the program. So. That's kind of the overview of Building Strong Communities and where we started. If we can go to the next slide. 
This gives you an idea of where we are. We are still um, at 81% of our target audience with 37% participants remaining. Um, we have completed our eight weeks of virtual construction training. Um, we are actually in week 10 right now. So again, we've done the four weeks of emotional intelligence. We did a physical awareness day um, in the metro area as well as, as Duluth, uh, where we had them work at a full day at just um, building scaffolding, uh, walking three miles, uh, uh, tying rebar, uh, moving materials, uh, learning the proper way to work in teams to, you know, um, move things. We they, they worked on rigging. And so just a lot of um, things to expose them to the physical nature of, of construction. We had our mock interviews spread out over three days. Um, we did, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, speed education day with the contractors and union officials. We distributed uh, uh, PPE to everyone on March 29th. They all went through a math assessment to determine which trades they were they could have more success in. Um, those skilled or licensed trades like the electricians, the sheet metal workers, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the pipe trades, the plumbers, um, sprinkler fitters and uh, pipe fitters, again, have to have a higher level of math in order to uh, go into those trades. And so we definitely want to do an assessment so that we know where they are. We got through our drug screening. We issued boots to everyone. And um, currently we're in our uh, final, actually two weeks now of our hands-on training and uh, visit and site visits. Um, we started the uh, two-week training at the Laborers Union this week. We've got seven individuals there. Um, next week, we're doing a bunch of uh, one-day uh, uh, training events. The uh, operating engineers is on Monday. On Tuesday, we'll be at the Cement Masons Training Center, so they'll spend all day there. On Wednesday, they'll spend all day at the finishing trades with the painters and allied tradespeople. Um, so just a lot of good stuff going on um, with, with two weeks left in the program of those 37 participants, five have already been extended apprenticeship opportunities. So we've got one operating engineer, um, two laborers and two iron workers already that um, have received apprenticeship opportunities. And we've been on um, several uh, construction site visits um, just earlier today. And I'm sure Krista will have some pictures to back up uh, our, our event today, but we were on the uh, the Green Line extension today. We had a handful of our um, our uh, participants uh, go there, and I won't steal too much of uh, Krista's thunder, but it was an outstanding event. Um, we had the safety director uh, talk to us about safety. We actually walked up the, um, the 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 ladder onto the bridge, and so we got a lot of footage up there. And it was just a really really cool experience, and so. Um, Graduation is on May 5th, but between now and then, we anticipate that there will be a lot more apprenticeship offers made and uh, individuals that will be starting a great career. So we're pretty excited that uh, things are going according to plan. So that's where we are right now. I uh, In our next meeting, I hope to have uh, an even better update. Great. Thank you for the update. Appreciate appreciate that. Appreciate those those, those progress steps, that's great to hear. So uh, next we're gonna get an update from the Green Line Extension Project Office. Oh, sorry for my poor lighting here. Um, so yeah, this is Nick Dial, uh, Director of Construction for Southwest Light Rail. Uh, just going through some project updates here. Um, in March, we signed a settlement agreement with LMJV outlines um, some of the various change orders that we've had up from December 31st that 2022 should say 2021 resolves change orders uh, for time based off of uh, uh, change orders we've experienced up to December 31st, 2021. The high, um, I guess the major change orders uh, that are in there um, would reflect uh, time required for the quarter protection barrier the Kenilworth tunnel redesign, i.e. the secant wall that we're um, installing um, in the Kenilworth corridor, and then uh, the addition of the Eden Prairie Town Center Station. Um, this uh, establishes a new civil construction schedule, um, can realigns project delivery from 
uh, multiple segments being delivered on both the east and western sides of the project to more of a, a western to eastern um, delivery mechanism. Um, this also establishes a process to resolve uh, known disputes prior to December 31st, 2021, and uh, avoids potential litigation. Next slide. Uh, this established in the new civil construction schedule adds approximately 34 and a half months um, to the overall uh, final completion date for the project. Um, 30 of those months uh, council is acknowledging as uh, as as due to the, the change orders and we are taking four and a half months uh, that are going to be subject to dispute resolution as we move through that process um, with the with the settlement agreement. Uh, the original civil construction completion date was October 31st, 2022, and our new civil construction completion date will now be September 18, 2025. Um, this agreement also established uh, new milestones, uh, like kind of what I was saying on the previous slide, as far as moving in a westerly to eastern um, direction from Eden Prairie up through Minneapolis um, and how those are being delivered and not only delivered but continued construction um, with our systems contractor Aldrich Parsons joint venture. Um, it also establishes some some new liquidated damages values and uh, we're currently awaiting signature on a zero cost change order to uh, and essentially bring some of the, the finer details within the agreement into uh, into the contract. Next slide. Um, the settlement agreement dispute resolution process is, uh, is just a process to resolve disputes um, in order to keep construction moving forward um, as we move through uh, the identified areas within the settlement agreement. Um, if, if we can't reach agreement, uh, it, it allows an evaluative mediator to help the parties uh, to reach an agreement. And then if those disputes continue unresolved, then, um, then we'll enter binding arbitration. Uh, the process will resolve calls, costs in the following categories. Uh, these are ex for extended performance, uh, labor and material escalation, um, subcontractor costs, and impacts to the productivity, productivity of work performed um, from December 31st, 2021 up to December 31st, 2021. Next slide. Uh, here's our next steps. So we've uh, essentially completed the revised construction schedule uh, for uh, with, London, uh, with London Macross and Joint Venture. And now we're um, in, in the middle of uh, getting some revised baseline uh, information from Aldrich Parsons Joint Venture, the systems contract, and then uh, we'll be uh, moving towards uh, the revised supporting contracts and testing, and that will give us our revised project opening day and costs. So at this point in time, we're comfortable in saying that revenue service is approximately in 2027, and the preliminary estimates for the project cost is going to be two point for total project costs is 2.65 billion to 2.75 billion, and uh, the revised costs and revenue service date will be established when all all agreements are finalized. Next slide. Uh, here's some construction work that we're seeing on segment three, which is uh, some ballasted track work being performed by RailWorks Delta and uh, some of their subcontractors. I can see the tamper on the uh, on the on the guideway there, and um, as we're leading through uh, through track construction in segment three, and as it nears completion. Next slide. Here's uh, some direct fixation track that's in the Trunk Highway 62 tunnel um, in Minnetonka. Next slide. Here's uh, some retaining wall construction activities on the left. You can see the no noise wall barriers. And then on the right is uh, uh, some of the retaining walls that are nearing completion um, down uh, in the, if you squint, you can see some crane activity and some uh, concrete um, pumps as they're completing uh, retaining wall 327, which is adjacent to Boston Scientific uh, over there in uh, Minnetonka. Next slide. Uh, here's a uh, Blake Road pedestrian underpass, uh, just some of the retaining walls as we move through that. You can see the tunnel uh, in the in the background there as uh, with, the, with the sheet pile wall will shortly be pulled and we'll begin regrading that area. 
Next slide. Here's a southerly connector, which you can see these tall retaining walls as the freight rail will be going um, over this portion of, uh, of the guideway there. Um, uh, as we, uh, uh, this bridge is immediately adjacent to uh, the Louisiana, Louisiana Avenue station in St. Louis Park. Next slide. And here's some Kenilworth LRT tunnel excavation activities as we're resuming excavation uh, uh, next to um, what we termed the short sheet repair adjacent to uh, Sika, uh, or about 750 feet away from Sika, and uh, as we're continuing excavation and moving toward the Cedar Lake Parkway. Next slide. That's all for me. Nick? Yeah. Uh, this is Ranti. You did have a question. Um, it was put into the chat. Um, question was, is there a clause for fuel ex escalation? Or do, does the council have a plan for dealing with fuel escalation on this contract? And if yes, does that include trucking? Um, I think that we've we are discussing what fuel is, is it for fuel escalation prior to 2021 should be included in the settlement agreement and then any kind of escalation um, after 2021 uh, should be negotiated with the prime contractor. Or at least discussed and then we can I'll discuss it. I can discuss it further with Dale. Any other questions for the project office team? Nick. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to DB achievement report. Next slide, please. So as you can see from the last report uh, to this month's report, the DB, the DB activity on the civil contract has slowed down a little bit. Um, achievement has de decreased by 1%. However, uh, the systems contract uh, has increased by 1%. Um, and the Franklin o m project uh, is continuing to close out the punch list items. Um, so the DB activity, of course, is minimal. And until all items are complete, we won't be able to close out this contract with a final um, achievement report and uh, uh, process. And um, we're still um, meeting or exceeding the goal, so it's a good thing. Um, and uh, I hope to continue to do so. That's that's the plan. Um, next slide. One thing I do want to uh, to mention, um, even though I know uh, Barb is not here, I know she would ask this question. Um, if we can go back to the to the other slide, I'm sorry. Um, the contract changes um, on the Franklin report, even though there's only um, closeout. Um, is is the changes are reflective of some of the final contract amounts after the contracts have been updated with the change order amounts. So that's that would be the the, the changes um, that you see there. Um, and there is a large decrease in the Crocus Hill contract. Um, and we did reach out to uh, the DBE Crocus Hill and they reported that all the items they planned to order for this project were completed and paid for. So uh, some of the supplied items from the original bid uh, were removed and, and never ordered. So any additional questions relative to those specific items um, will be um, answered by LSB, LS Black, when uh, they come back in May to do a kind of a final uh, report and lessons learned uh, for the May meeting. Any questions? All right. Next up. We have Krista to give us an update on the civil DBE activities. Wonderful, thanks, Shante. 
Um, so we'll go into it, dive right in with our first slide. Um, we are highlighting this month, um, Kathy, uh, Boys Water Products, a great TV that has been in the industry for quite some time now. And for me being on the highway heavy now compared to the vertical, it's great to be able to, um, to have Kathy and her, her crew on our, our project. They are a second tier subcontractor supplier for us with Minger Construction. Um, great contractor, great partnership between the two of them. Um, the, the comments from all of our field, is, it's really exciting to hear the comments. As you can see, their contract to date is 900,000. Estimated completion is two summers from now. And um, I had to pick, I got six responses from people when I reached out regarding giving me a statement about working with boys. And um, Wyatt Held, who is a project manager from Minger, um, had this to say that Boys Water product, Products is an excellent team to work with. They're very creative in identifying material sourcing solutions, which is particularly helpful in the current operating environment. Um, it has been interesting having meetings with Kathy and the Minger team regarding um, the, the opportunities they've had to show their expertise you know in the services they provide and seriously to have them a part of our the the light rail team and the dbe representative um great so it's really fun to highlight them next slide please so i just gave a quick quick overview of the activities that i've been involved with over the past month um, Big Deal was attending the Association of Women of Contractors annual awards luncheon. That was very fun to see, and it's awesome having Kendra on today. So thank you for being a part of part of our project, Kendra. Um, but it was really fun, you know, the handing over of the gavel from the past president to the current present president is really neat to see. Um, it's fun to watch the the growth of the individuals. Um, Kia Isaacson was an individual, she was Lakeside Area Flooring, um, great DBE contractor as well. She she handed over the gavel and boy, has that individual grown in her presentation um, opportunities and stuff. So it was, it was an honor to be there representing our uh, light rail project and the joint venture. Um, we had Women in Construction Week, um, you know, this last month and we had a great event that day, one of the days, uh, Rosies of the Rail. And we included our woman-owned DB ear firms um, that are on the light rail project. And to, to see the individuals in the room um, and their excitement of being a part of the Rosies of the Rail team, very, very cool. Um, let's see, we've had very various meetings and Ashanti and John, who's not on um, right now, can you know agree. There's there's a lot going on when it comes to the rail project and with the, the council's presentation earlier, you know, with the change orders and stuff, there's, it, it's definitely not an easy one for everyone. And to have the magnitude of DBEs we have working on this project, um, being able to give them their resources and um, partnerships to, to try and ensure success for everyone is, is an interesting challenge. Um, but it's also great to be able to be a part of um, assisting, you know, the DBEs and, and everything. So those meetings um, continue forward. We're going to be doing some education outreach pieces over this next year, as we've been seeing where, where the assistance is needed, you know, with um, invoicing and making sure the supporting documents are there. So clarity when it comes to approval of payment, um, that'll be a that's probably going to be our first DBE education outreach event. Um, so a lot's been happening, lots going to be happening. The other cool thing was I was like first question when I registered for this event and I said, hey, I always need to learn about new DBEs or previous ones that I haven't met. I participated in Hennepin County's small biz virtual networking event and met three while well, I already knew one of the contractors. Um, but met two additional ones and great event and hoping to be able to bring them on to our project. So that is it, except for the next, I have one more slide for DBE, I do believe. And it's our update on change orders. Um, 
you know, the, the approved change orders through March 15th was 210 million, almost $211 million. Our DBE job participation to date is 20.46. And as Ashante showed in that previous slide, the participate, the percentage, not participation, the percentage did decrease, but it was also our winter months where on site we did not have the amount of contractors that we normally would. So of course you're gonna see a slight decrease. So hopefully over the next couple months, you'll see an increase again. Does anybody have any questions regarding the DBE participation? If not, that's all I have for now. Yeah, Krista, this is Gilbert. How are you? Hi, Han. Good. How are you? Sorry. Very well. Very well. <laughs> See, a quick question about this uh, second bullet point. This 20.46, is that uh, the DBE participation in relation to change orders or overall project? That is including the change orders. Including it's the change the entirety. orders. Yep. Okay. And then the, the second well, question I had, and the second question I had, maybe it's to Nick, but I, I probably should ask it at this time. In relation to the settlement between LMJV and um, the council, where do where do the DBEs fall in, in terms of their change orders and the impacts to their businesses? What where, where do they fall well, in that? I, I understand what you're asking, Gilbert. And I, I knew somebody would ask the question. Um, in regards to legalities of it, there shouldn't be a, that great of an impact, but in regards to the LMJV and our subcontractors, you should see an increase with that because of some of the items that were involved with the change orders, you know, with the growth of that monetary amount um, include some of the work being done by our DBE contractors. I hope that answers it. Okay. Yeah. I would also add, and, and hopefully, yes, Nick can, can chime in here. I know that part of um, within that agreement, the hope is uh, that some of the those outstanding ones can be processed a lot faster and quicker. Um, and then also, um, oh, I lost my train of thought here. Anyways, Nick, um, help me out. Yeah, no problem, Ashanti, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, as far as um, as far as change order management goes, I, th I think it, it probably feels like we're at, we're a little we're a little stalled out as far as change orders are concerned. But we're we we developed a way to process change orders a little bit quicker, utilizing the settlement agreement, and we're at the final uh, portions of that. We took a we're, we're waiting on uh, something from the mediator right now, and as soon as we get that, then that'll release um you know i think it's like 170 change orders uh under two hundred fifty thousand dollars that will be processed through rebuilder and then um we also have some higher dollar value change orders that we're continuing to negotiate with omjv and then uh, if we have any issues then we're going to uh, utilize that dispute resolution process that i mentioned earlier um i i'm hopeful that we can come to a negotiated um uh, amount and not not need to really utilize that process, but it's there um, for a reason, you know, in case we can't agree on something. And so, um, yeah, we're we're looking to move a lot of the change orders that are in the backlog. So I appreciate everybody's patience as we work through this process. I know it's probably been very difficult, uh, Gilbert, as you as you're kind of talking about, you know, some of these small small businesses uh, and DBs here. Um, uh, you know, it's just uh it's it's just moving as part of the process of the agreement and once once we get through this i think things are going to start moving a little bit quicker and you guys should start seeing some funding to these change orders that you'll be allowed to build to um i'm hopeful in the next month but uh we'll see so to add you guys what nick had to say just to provide some clarity for some of the attendees for today's meeting um in regards to the the change order stuff that we're talking about some of it is for work that's already completed, but some of it's also for work that's still yet to be completed. So with what my first answer was to Gilbert was for that work still coming. And the very important piece that Ashante brought up and that Nick responded to is we do have DBEs that have performed some major work for us that we are waiting. They are patient, patiently. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I appreciate yeah, everybody's patience. Payment. 
Yeah. Yeah. And and we do too. And we we the LMJV is doing everything we can along with our partners Ashante and, and John with the Met Council on keeping the, the DBEs aware of where we are at with everything because as soon as they can get the money, they are gonna get their money. Um and Gilbert, you know how very passionate I am about um ensuring that as much as I can do my you know, but so everybody understands there's two phase there's two parts to the, the change order. There's the work already completed and then the work yet to come. And note that the LMJV takes us very serious and understands, you know, the relationships and the needs for the finances. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. All right, if there's no more questions, uh, we can go to the next for the systems. All right, thank you, Ashante. Uh, this is <clears throat> Chris Cannon with APJV. I'll talk about the uh, systems project. <clears throat> so, um, like Nick said, with the uh, settlement of the uh, LMJV stuff, our the dates for our access uh, is impacted by that. So, um, a lot of our access um, dates got moved into uh, 2023. So this year is gonna be kind of similar to last year as far as our field work. Um, we're gonna be doing some traction power substation foundations and things like that. Uh, but in the near term here for the one month look ahead, uh, we're doing a lot of uh, build out still at our storage facility in Golden Valley to accept all the material that's gonna be coming in for the project. We have another substation <clears throat> being delivered uh, in Gunner, it's a Gunner substation, it's TPS 301. And then um, once uh, work starts at the next station, which was, is identified as Wooddale, Gunner will be doing uh, some communications work for us at that station, putting in back boxes uh, for the communications work. So our main subs uh, in the next month or so for DBE is Gunner. Our gunner and public solutions helping out with the uh, notifications of our work. Next slide, please. So our change orders uh, through the uh, early March are just over $12 million. Uh, our DBEs that are participating, uh, the majority are gunner. You can see just over 2 million dollars generation cable 413,000 and then Carlo um, for the OCS polls about 280,000. Our DBE change order participation to date is just under 21 percent and our job participation to date is just over 17 percent. And I think that's it for a DBE update from us unless anyone has any questions. Yeah, Chris, uh, this is Gilbert again. Uh, my question is about your change order. So I understand it's not probably part of the LMJV um, settlement process, but what is the process for your change order approval? I mean, this, yeah. this here, change order, change orders approved through March is this amount, but are there any other outstanding ones that would impact DBEs? Um, there's, there's, um, there's additional uh, change orders that have DBE participation, but you know we're working through them um, as we get our change orders negotiated with the council. We negotiate our change orders with our subs, our DBE subs, and um, so far to date, things have been going very well as far as you know timeliness of getting our stuff approved from the council and then passing that on to the uh, our DBEs, our DBE subcontractors. Thank you, Chris. So I, I take it that this these this twelve million that is approved through March, that is in the process of being paid out, then right, or billed and paid out. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chris, and uh, turn it back over to Scott. Great, thanks. Um, so the next 
Next item will be the uh, Ellis Block Franklin OMF building modification. Uh, which I think Shanti, it looks like there was, there was some minimal activity on that, so we didn't have uh, an update on that. So we're just going to move forward to the workforce participation reporting. And Elaine will take it from here. Thank you, Scott. Thanks. Uh so for February, uh, LMJV logged 28,623 hours. Since the start of the project, they had logged 1,923,252 hours. Uh, for the month, they came in at 5.2% for women. They're at 8.1% overall. For uh, people of color and indigenous people, they came in at 22.86% and they were at 23.34%. There were no hours that were reported as uh, unspecified. And overall, they're at 0.64% uh, of their hours as unspecified. Next slide, please. So here's the breakdown on the hours in February. As I said, zero hours for unspecified. Uh, white women logged um or worked i should say 763 hours or 3% um women of color worked 724 hours or also about 3% uh, men of color worked 5820 hours which came in at about 20% and white men came in at 21315 hours or 74% next slide please And on the civil project, uh, the trucking hours that are being counted towards the project goals, uh, MBE has worked 26,639 hours. ZTS has worked 4,372 hours. Rock-ons um, hours have been stagnant for a couple months now, 1,375 hours. And next slide, please. The systems contracts um, with Aldrich Parsons, they worked 120 hours in February, and since the start of their work, they've worked 2,900 hours. They did not have any uh, participation by women during the month of February. They're at 10.96 overall for women. They did have 28.33% for POCI, and overall they're at 13.94. 95%. And they have no unspecified hours on their project. Next slide, please. For the Franklin project, um, they, this uh, slide says they worked 44 hours, but I just received the March um, certified the payroll certified through Mar end of March. And actually in February, they worked 44 hours. However, they did not have any women or uh, people of color and, indig and indigenous people working on the project. So those numbers stay the same. But based on the 44 hours, they were at overall, they're at 8.89% and for women and 23.21% for POCI. 4.59% uh, of unspecified hours. And there were a couple of their subs that didn't enter, had entered their hours late. That's what the discrepancy is. And go to the next slide. Basically, the percentage is that it was all white men that worked on the project, and that did not change with the actual 100 hours. Excuse me. Apologize, that was my phone. And I believe that is all I have, unless there, anyone has any questions. Thank Thanks, you. Any, any questions before we keep moving? All right, well, I'll be excited to see how those uh, those hours 
develop, hopefully continue to increase as we get into a, a busier season. I know relatively relatively few hours and particularly few hours for APJB at this point. So hopefully as kind of hours ramp up, we'll also continue to see greater numbers on, on those trends. So appreciate it. So now um, turn it over to Krista to go through LMJV's workforce activities. Wonderful, thank you, Scott. All right, so we're gonna buzz through some of these kind of quick because I have some pictures that I am very excited um, to share with you along with events. Um, so here's what we have a month in a picture. There's, there's certain things that happen every single month to help with our workforce development. We have our monthly subcontractor meetings um, that are mandatory for every subcontractor that's on site for the previous month and the upcoming month. Um, each month we do ask a separate meeting, you know, a question um, regarding, you know, their participation in different things. The other great new thing about the subcontractor meetings is I have a co-partner now moving forward on these meetings, and that is Elaine from the Department of Human Rights. We're excited to have her on board with us. Um, Elaine and I have done this before with other projects, and it's just been great um, to have that other piece of um, knowledge and, and, you know, support that can be given to our subcontractors is great. And just real quick, in regards to the subcontractors participation, Elaine and I will be working together on reviewing uh, the good faith effort reports that our subcontractors submit to me each month. Um, and those that maybe have high workforce hours, but low good faith effort uh, report and, you know, lack of you know, outreach efforts and stuff, we will be meeting with those subcontractors um, and there will be accountability um, pieces put in place in our work plan for regarding that. The other thing we do on the, the monthly meeting is our internal team. Um, we are continually meeting uh, regarding mentorship and spring workforce and such. Just like the, the lower, the, there's another team, my superintendents and I discuss weekly our workforce um, and also our, our DBE um, work going on on each of the you know areas segments of the, the project so that we know if there's any questions or additional help needed. We have our monthly good faith effort meetings with you guys, our monthly DWAC meetings, as well as my meetings. And I, I have on here weekly, um, but I think Thomas would agree we're almost on a daily basis now uh, with building strong communities because of the great things happening um, right now as we're getting close to graduation. So that's that's kind of a monthly regular nutshell picture. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, last month was a busy, very, very busy month, which is great. Um, as you can see, uh, the various meetings that took place, a lot of training um, started last month and we'll continue moving forward as we're doing a lot of onboarding with bringing back superintendents and foremen and subs. We had WIC week, Women in Construction week. We had our Rosies of the Rail panel um, with people both workforce side and DBE. We had a great, uh, very many mentorship program planning meetings. Um, we're getting excited to roll out in June the LMJV mentorship program, which will um, encompass a couple of our brand new um, apprentices we are bring, bringing on board, as well as some returning first and second year apprentices um, will be a part of our mentorship program. Um, our weekly meetings with HR that I have regarding um, tracking our enter and exit each month so we can see, you know, who we have coming on. But the other important piece, and, and uh, um, Scott, with our meeting that we had yesterday, the exit, you know, um, when, when somebody gets transferred or laid off, you know, because of the, the lower work needed, you know, that stuff is easily tracked. But the part that I really want to pay attention to is that voluntary leave. Those individuals that for some reason are leaving um, their trade or industry, um, trying to connect with them beforehand is very important to me. So that's why we're going to be tracking this information. Um, we've had mock interviews with the Building Strong Communities program. 
um, boy, the individuals we had from the light rail project that were a part of the mock interviews were so excited after those interviews for that next um, piece. And that was on March 29th and Thomas had talked about it. We had the light rail project facts presentation. We'll have to give it to you guys sometime here because it's a really cool presentation. But it was followed with what we call talk with the trades event where we had actual people from our field team as well as um, our subcontractors and our par systems partner um, being able to tell the individuals that are in the program more answer their questions one on one instead of the big group settings and stuff and extremely successful event. Um, so if you could do the next slide, please. Here's a couple pictures, you guys, from the Rosies of the Rail event. Here was our panel up above. We have Tina, um, who is our individual who over helps oversees the quality and change orders on our project. To the right of her with the white sweater on is the Aldrich representative, Brenda Reiner, project manager. She kind of is a, a go-to do-all um, you know, with Aldrich. We have Mary in the Mary who is in the middle. She's been with CS McCrossin for over 20 years. She is a key to the success of kind of pulling us all together in different areas. She wears many different hats and is just a treat. The next individual with a striped sweater is Alicia. Some of you have had the pleasure of meeting her. I wish for someday you all to meet her. Um, she is one of our project engineers. Assistant, she actually is a Mankato State um, engineer student and their program that they have set up for construction now is actually where you're working um, during your education and she has many things that she has to do because of it like she's participating quite a bit with me on um, presenting and different things like that well then she has to in turn go to her class and talk about who she's working with on the project and why um very very great individual um her story of how she got to where she is today is one that really opens a lot of people's eyes up of the you know kind of the the road to get to where you are uh the next individual with the glasses and baseball hat is a current field cement finisher not on the light rail program project she is going to be phased in at some point when she decides she's she's assisting the cement finishers union um their training center currently um this individual i have worked with since the day she started her apprenticeship um back during the state capital project um the what she brought to the table for the um attendees at this was over the top and then the picture below was the on-site tour that they got after the rosies of the rail panel Next slide, please. Here shows, Thomas, here's just a couple of the great pictures from that evening. Here was the talk with the trades event that we had um, with the Building Strong Communities Program. Um, you guys, the people that we had from the LMJV include, if you see the bottom right picture, of bottom right for me, um, that's Dale Even and Manny Walk. Those are our two project leads that were there the entire time of this. I mean, we had, I'd say we had 24 people from the LMJV at this event. Um, there's lots going on. Um, you know, we talk about recruitment, but as you guys have heard me talk about lately, my big key for the success of our project is the retention, um, which we talk about the mentorship and everything like that, but it's, it's our relationships. And before I go into our cool slides from today, I really want to let you guys know and the, the community based organizations that are on this call right now are the key people that I need to connect with, um, especially moving forward. And one of the big things I would like to do with each one of you is to sit down and meet with you, not just about what recruitment pieces you have, but what other stages of construction um, assistance you can give, not just the LMJV, but our subcontractors and our workforce. So look forward to connecting with each one of you. The other thing we will be doing, and I'm looking at a June date, we don't have it scheduled yet, is to host an event where each of you, the community-based organizations, get to give a presentation to our subcontractors about the services you guys can provide them, followed by that 
you know, like social event where you can more one on one connect with each one of our subcontractors. You have great resources that I would like to utilize, but I also really want our subs to be able to to know, you know, what they can be doing also. So there's that piece. And if I could share with you guys, let's see how good I am at this. I think I got it. I have photos from today's event. And I will just buzz through them real quick because as you can see, can you all see them now? They're kind of silly. The beginning are our great captains from today's event. We have our safety representative, Dan. He's one of our safety directors. Followed by Thomas. I don't know if I can. Can you guys see these okay or not? Yeah, we can see them. Yeah, yeah, we, can yeah see we can see them. See them. Okay. Thanks, Kristen. I'm just scrolling through the document. I did them so quick because Thomas and I had such a great event. It was like, oh, I was going to put them in PowerPoint. So sorry. There's another. There's Norma, one of the advocates for building strong communities. Great thing with Norma, as you guys know, she's Twin Cities Urban League. But actually, if you can tell by the hard hat, she is wearing a Swanson and Youngdale's hard hat. She started her career not at the Urban League, but actually as a painter. She was a union painter for many, many years. We found out today, we thought we knew each other because of the Urban League general contractor connection. Mm -mm. I used to work for 3M Construction and so did she when she was with Swanson and Youngdale. So we actually, her project manager and I um, worked together daily and I actually met Norma. Years, so that was uh, about 30 years ago, you guys. Not 25, more or less. So anyways, there's Norma, great advocate, great part of the team. Let's see. Uh, well, there's a big close-up of the two of us. And there's Ashley, our project engineer I talked about. Here's the start of the tour. Look at the mud they got to walk through today, you guys. Big puddles. And there they are. There's one of the bridges that we are working on. Now, if you look behind, there's a big set of scaffolding. We're getting through the mud. We're getting there. Here's what they all got to climb up today. It looks easy. Ask Thomas, it's not easy. <laughs> all right, here's the team up on top of the bridge. Look at all that rebar. They got to actually see what it looks like for the rebar and other areas of construction. There's a great view of Hopkins and such looking down from the train, the rails. Here's our safety director talking to the group. Here's another cool picture of them up, going up the rise of the deal. There's another one, Thomas smiling, having a fun old time. Let's see here. There's our, this was one of our field laborers. Um, he is just, he's one of the foremen on the project. His back is to us in the yellow hoodie. Uh, great individual for the team to talk to answer the questions about all of the various roles a laborer plays on a project. Uh, got stuck. Uh, here, here's the view coming down, those lovely steps that they got to climb down. Here's Ashley giving a presentation at one of our stations. There are currently, there are 15 stations on the project. By the end of this year, five of those stations will are scheduled to be complete. And there's another really cool picture of the station. Gunner Electric did the wiring in it, by the way, everybody, DBE contractor. A lot of the, the work here you see was done by the DBE, some of the DBE firms. And that is it for our slide presentation. Um, all right, any questions about our outreach and workforce? Scott, I mean, Thomas, you have your hand up. No, I was just trying to do a reaction and I end up raising my hand. <laughs> I love it. I love it, you guys. Thank you guys. I see Sheila and Julie's notes. Um, very, very cool. I, I seriously look forward to it. I know we've talked before in the past, but wheels are moving forward. This will be great. Thank you guys. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the updates, Krista. Just my, my one question actually is, you know, in, in sort of thinking about as we move forward, 
just curious as to your thoughts, and I know this is a bigger conversation, but how do we, or how do you see, you know, working with subs, particularly on trying to, you know, help them? And what things do you think have been particularly helpful in terms of trying to help them, you know, do effective outreach, but also, you know, once they've brought people in, take effective steps around retention. So just curious as to your thoughts on that, because I think there is a longer conversation about that and we've got enough time left on this project that retention I think is going to play a critical role. So just thoughts on that. Very cool. I love the question, Scott, and to hear your support regarding or the importance of the retention piece um, is it, it helps me continue forward because like I've said, there, there's recruitment advocacy, retention, and education. And those last two pieces, the R and E, are going to be, they're my goals on the project, which means they're then also, um, part of it is the inclusion of my subcontractors or the subcontractors, you know, they're my, mine, you know, whatever. But the big piece is when it comes to the subcontractors, you know, um, is ensuring sharing of information with the subcontractors regarding the community-based organizations and the great things that they have to bring to the table um, is one of the pieces. The other piece is sharing our mentorship program, sharing that um, the guidelines that we are in the process of setting up um, and working forward with those. Minger Construction is one, Gunner Electric um, and a few others are already um, on board with wanting to be a part of that mentorship program um, to be able to really work closely. You know, a lot of companies already are, but the education piece is on truly what it is with re relationships, um, passing on our pieces that we're utilizing, but also growing in regards to the respectful workplace training that takes place. Um, those are two of the biggest keys right there, Scott, but also noting the importance of the LMJV, holding our subs accountable regarding their outreach activities. Um, I can't hold them accountable for their percentages, but what I can do is, is ensure, well, to a, to a part, you know, um, is working with them each month. Like I talked about that Elaine and I will be doing, we will be looking at the workforce hours um, their workforce participation numbers and their good faith efforts. And, um, you know, kind of looking at that and giving resources and expectations on, say, say a, a, I'll just give a great example. Say a sub has high workforce hours, but very low participation. And they say, well, I reached out to our union and they don't have anybody. Well, my next question always is then, well, did you talk with Summit Academy? Did you work with Building Strong? Did you reach out to the Urban League or Goodwill Easter Seals? You know, and they say, uh, in the past, the answer used to automatically be, well, my union doesn't have anybody. Well, that's not at all an acceptable answer for us anymore. Um, and so it's, what is their commitment? You know, they all, for those that have over a thousand hours on the project, they're required to have an active work plan with us and to, to give updates and everything, to give those good faith effort reports. Um, and, you know, bottom line and the exact scale has not been set yet. That's something Dale and I are working very closely with others on is, you know, if a sub remains in non-compliance, um, bottom line, uh, we can withhold, we can withhold payment as part of their subcontract agreement. I hope we don't ever have to get to that, but we will have those standards set up in place moving forward for part of our work plan. I hope that helps. Yeah, that does. Thanks, Krista. Um, Thomas, did you have a question? Well, just a, a comment. Uh, many of you on on this call may know that I play a dual role, not only as a program manager for Building Strong Communities, but I'm also an HR workforce development for Met Council. And um, one of the things that I think that we need to do better in order to, I mean, to assist with answering that question, 
is to get the word out to the subcontractors about our CCAR program that we came out with last year. It's the Council Contractor Apprenticeship Reimbursement Program. And a lot of the subs don't know that if they do hire individuals that have come through Building Strong Communities, again, if they're trying to you know, um, increase their participation, if they hire any of our apprentices, um, they get reimbursed up to $11,500 um for the hours that that apprenticeship is working not just on this project but any met council project and um again in the grand scheme of things may not be you know that much money but for a, a smaller subcontractor that may be the motivation that they need because as we know you know some of the the um the production goes down when you have new apprentices on there and so that uh, council uh, contractor apprenticeship reimbursement is a way to kind of you know offset some of the the lost production by uh, pairing that new person up with that experienced person. So again, getting that word out that there is motivation to help you out with the you know with your participation is something that I think we can do better at the council. Um, Minger, we have mentioned them a couple of times. They have definitely um, utilized that CCAR program. Stonebrook Fence and I think a few others have used it, but. There's a lot more that if we could just get the word out to all of our subs, they might utilize that. And and that's 11,500 per apprentice that they hire that works on council projects. We love it. We look forward to utilizing it. I, had, I do have to add one other piece when it comes to what we do look at with the subcontractors, you know, with what they submit to us on a month, you know, per month. We do also look at their company as a whole with what their participation is because some of the smaller companies, even though they may have large numbers on the project, we also take a look at how many other projects they have going on. Um, and the majority of them, especially, you know, these are highway heavy crews, you know, and, and everything. So to look at their company as a whole is also a big piece for ours. That's all Great. for me. Great, thanks Krista, I appreciate all those thoughts. Uh, all right, turn it over to Mike to give the update on APJV workforce activities. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Mike from APJV. And um, so Chris mentioned that, you know, 2023 is going to look a lot like 2022. Um, you know, I think through 2020, 2021, uh, we've had a in early 2022, we've had a total of 2,900 hours um, with 120 hours being in February. I think we had another, uh, I think we had three guys work to uh, 120 hours for Gunner, so not much. Yeah, I think we have had one person work in March for about 140 hours to receive the, the traction power substations over at the Honeywell plant um, in Golden Valley. So it's not gonna be much uh, this year. You know, we're, we're expected the earliest to get on site will be on July. I mean, Gunner's going to be doing a little bit here and there, um, maybe a little bit here and there, but if, it's going to be piecemeal. So, um, you know, that's going to be our work this year. So, you know, maybe 10,000 hours in 2022, uh, you know, it's kind of what I'm hearing. Um, but in March, we were able to celebrate uh, the Women in Construction Week and the get togethers and various, you know, you know, in person and as well as on Zoom meetings. Um, so that's always good to see all the women out there. Uh, we participated in mock interviews at Summit Academy on March 25th. Um, always good. And then, um, you know, it's Building Strong Communities. We had Brenda and Jason uh, work with, um, you know, talking to Building Strong Communities and really had positive things to say about that whole program there. And, um, and many of our you know, subcontractors are working under the LMJV. So, you know, when you talk about that retention and we're seeing that that avenue, you know, hopefully these these people are there, these trades, you know, can help transfer over to our scope when when that's done. You know, so so you know, hopefully we can, you know, as as we go into twenty twenty seven over the next five years, you know, hopefully, you know, be opportunities to you go to the civil, go to the systems. Uh, with the same subcontractor that being used on, you know, the, on both projects, on both contracts. So um, that's where we stand now. Not not a whole lot. So let's hurry up and wait. That's what we're doing. And uh, I'll keep coming back. Great. I appreciate those those updates. Any any questions for Mike? 
So uh, hearing none, we'll, uh, we'll keep moving to the uh, community discussion section and I'll turn it over to Ashanti for the moment. Thanks, Scott. So as I mentioned before, um, we have the opportunity now that the uh, council um, has uh, moved to uh, public meetings, uh, in-person public meetings starting April 25th. Uh, we definitely wanted to have uh, um, the conversation in terms of how this committee wants and chooses to move forward uh, with how we conduct our business and how we conduct our meetings. And we've had some uh, <clears throat> some internal discussions, both with the regional administrator, uh, also with uh, OGC. And one thing that has been made uh, evident to us is that this meeting is not subject to um, some of the open meeting laws um, or the open meeting laws that really govern uh, the council and standing committee meetings. So it gives us a lot of uh, leeway and discretion in, ter in terms of how we want to move forward. So we are, we are not required and no one has mandated that we go back to in-person in, in meetings. Um, so like I said, it's, it's really going to be up to us. Um, so this means we can choose uh, to, remain, to remain virtual or return to uh, meeting in person uh, as we did before um, at the uh, project office uh, location. So um, I wanted to, or we wanted to have the conversation and open it up to committee member uh, input and, um, and hear what you have to say. And with the goal of, of having a vote um, uh, finally to decide how we move forward. And uh, the only other guidance I would ask or, or that I would add is, is this. Um, with all that said, what I said before in terms of open meeting law and how it does or does not pertain to this particular meeting, I will say in some of the guidance that we've received and, and the input from the regional administrator and others, is it's going to be in everyone's best interest that we do move one way or the other, uh, meaning that the, the choice would be to um, remain virtual or go back to uh, in-person versus trying to do a hybrid. That complicates things both um, not, not only from a logistics standpoint, but also in terms of uh, what, what sort of rules and policies do apply, um, trying to uh, make this a hybrid. So that's kind of the two options that we have realistically is um, all the way virtual or all the way in person. Um, so with that, I open it up for feedback um, or any comments, um, opinions, um, that people might have or would like to offer um, at this time. Hey, Shanti, this is Alex from Twin Cities Rise. So my question is, so I hear the complications of a hybrid offer, but my question is, is there any consideration to there being dual meaning? Th certain ones that are can be live, so maybe it's once a quarter, and then the other one be virtual. So not having them be virtual and in person at the same time, as much as it is having the option for some of them to be virtual and some to be to be in person? That is a very good question. Um, um, one I didn't anticipate. Um, so um, it, there was no complication really mentioned with that. And, you know, now that you posed the question, I could see that, you know, there might be uh, some sort of meeting that would be beneficial to have in person, especially at the project office, if there was something planned or something going on. So um, with that, we haven't received any specific guidance or opinions about that at this time. So I, I will say it's on the table. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, because that would be, like I said, my personal preference. Like, I want to be able to meet everybody at some point face to face. That would be important just from a networking standpoint. But there is also some value, not even some. There's a tremendous amount of value of me being able to hop off one thing and hop into this knowing that I could be here. If I had to get in my car and travel to somewhere, the ability for me to be present may not be as consistent as it has been because I can log into something. So that's just my position on it. Excellent, excellent points for sure. Please go ahead. <laughs> Did you like my, if I click on the hand raising thing, I won't know how to turn it off. So um, I appreciate it. And I absolutely love what Alex brought to the table. Um, so what I, my recommendation from the LMJV would be that we did a quarterly in-person one, you know, with the presentation and with all that, with networking followed, you know, that opportunity to have those one. I think that would be seriously amazing. I was initially going to say I wanted to go back to fully in person just because those that already know me know that I like being able to have the round table discussions in person and stuff like that. But yet the being able to present to everybody online like this and then to be able to hop in to write that next meeting is also yeah. so very important. So um, if we can do that, that duo, you know, where quarterly we have the in person, you know, and but then the other month, the fill in months, you know, do it the other, you know, the video conference. I like it. Then I can bring my subs too that need to present. Anyone else? Yeah, this is uh, John. I, I like the idea of two a meeting quarterly. Um, I also have, uh, we brought this up in the beginning of the project. The project office is a, is a great place if you have um, transportation. So um, it would really be great to, uh, we, we considered this when we were meeting in person before, um, back in the day that, you know, perhaps we do a community center somewhere close to the light rail or somewhere close to the uh, um, uh, transportation accessibility for folks. Um, it's kind of interesting. We all brought up, uh, we did a memorial for Mel Reeves and we always talked about how Mel, you know, got rides from people, right? So it's really important for us to remember that because um, your, your office is, uh, you know, as much as it's Metro Transit, it's a, it's a tough one to get to if you're on the bus. So um, I would, I would uh, like to propose that at some time we, uh, you know, uh, look at um, whatever. It could be a nonprofit, a community center close to the rail, uh, who knows what. But somewhere where if the public did want to attend uh, one of our pieces on that quarterly meeting that um, we would uh, make that accessible like we are right now. And I realize a lot of people don't come to this, but even for members, um, you know, back to Mel and stuff, it's just kind of a nice thing to be able to do that. So. I see Krista is offering in the chat that to post if any time you want to do that. And I'm sorry, I'm just trying to read and see what people are putting in the chat too. So I'm going to read it out loud just in case we do have people listening um, from the public. Um, a lot of support for Alex's uh, recommendation and Krista's uh, idea. Um, Yep, I prefer to continue virtual, but like Alex's recommendation, um, on behalf of AWC, we would like to see these meetings continue to be virtual as we start to ramp up the busy construction season with the location and the travel needed. For many of us, it could prove to be quite difficult. And then I agree with John's point about not meeting at the project office. Um, the LMJV would be happy to sponsor the meeting in person at our office. So, and I, it sounded like someone was going to chime in. Go ahead. I did chime in. This is Tony O'Brien from Summit Academy. We'd be happy to sponsor an event if you needed a location. 
Awesome. I also <clears throat> would definitely consider, uh, well, I'm sure that we could, um, in terms of the council, um, look at something at the uh, Haywood in the chambers of one of the large, larger construction uh, or construction uh, conference rooms at Haywood. It's right on uh, several bus lines and uh, close to uh, the uh, light rail. Um, but again, I, I'll, and I'll just offer my feedback. Um, I think the, the virtual aspect um, definitely um, has uh, uh, makes it convenient, and I think it our our attendance has benefited from uh, being virtual because it is, in my opinion, easier for folks to attend virtual. But I, if I'm being honest, I do like um, Alex's uh, caveat of being able to have the option to have a meeting, whether it be quarterly or or periodically to be in person, um, that you just can't replace that, that type of networking and interaction um, in a virtual setting. Um, but that's, so those are my, um, I'm sorry, I'm laughing at Elaine's comments in the chat. Um, uh, yes, so that, that's my opinion. Shanti, the project office is very dusty. And when we were meeting in person, I always ended up having um, asthma attacks. And Mary Elena from LMJB also would get really sick. Um, that That's why I made that comment. And I, we used to have the interchange uh, meetings at Haywood. So I'm well aware of the ventilation system there. Good, good. No, and I didn't mean to make light of um, your situation, Elaine, um, but I definitely, too, um, especially um, given my role in the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity, I am really um, uh, keen to the point that uh, uh, John brought up about access and uh, folks being able to, um, not everyone um having uh transportation yeah i i think that's an excellent point and i'm glad he i'm glad you brought that up john this is scott one thing that you know i'll offer is um human rights could potentially host in the future as well our offices in in st paul at fairview and university that's right right by a white rail stop and right across from uh actually right across from goodwill so that's in that Griggs Midway building. So that's that's potentially an option too. We are most most of our staff are are working remotely, but we are doing some some in person work and have been trying to you know, bring folks back in for particularly collaborative type events. And so I think this this idea of you know really trying to focus in on you know if we're going to do some you know like a quarterly in person meeting. It was mentioned, I think, by Chris to the idea of doing networking, things like that, I think has has a lot of value. So um open open to exploring that. I'm not sure exactly what the needs are for for a space uh, since I never att never attended any of the in-person versions of these meetings in the past, but that's that's potentially something on the table too. I don't think so to that point, since there's quite a few people, it seems like that has really cool spaces. So I'm excited about that. It's like if we're planning to do it quarterly, that's for a year, right? So even if we rotated them through, so it doesn't have to be at the same spot in person, correct? Correct. So that's that's definitely I was you you I was just about to mention that. Um again, quarterly, like like you said, would be for a year. Um we could rotate them. Um, Summit has uh, definitely offered. I've been over there. They, they've got some good space for meetings. Um, it's, uh, uh, if, and if any other uh, community organizations um, have the space or location and they want to also offer up as one of the rotation spots, um, that'd be great. 
Um, I just want to confirm that I'm hearing that really the two options on the table just from the discussion is to either stay virtual or to go virtual with the flexibility of having, um, you know, quarterly uh, in-person uh, meetings. And just keep in mind with the light rail, you guys, um, the one time of year maybe that we host it, it could be followed by a project tour, walking tour from our office. I think that's a great idea, Krista. This is Julie Brecky. I mean, just having it somewhat close and, and to the work at hand, I think that's a great idea. I agree. I think that would be nice. Actually. Any other discussion? Let me uh, say, yep. Agreed, Krista, great idea. Um, how much space is needed? Um, I don't, I don't know. Like Scott, I was, my experience at the council has been all pandemic. So I, I I don't have any other experience at the council other than um, maybe a brief brief uh, month or so of uh, being in the office. It's like thirty is what's in the chat, so that's fair. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, if there's no more discussion. Um, Scott, if you could do the roll call and you and each uh, member indicate um, uh, virtual or virtual or I don't even know, I, I haven't come up with a, 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 a real uh, snazzy uh, kind of description for the um, virtual with uh, quarterly, virtual with quarterly in person. There we go. Or just call it hybrid. Ah, see, I was trying to stay away from that because then it's out. Yeah. It sounds like hybrid. Is your, I like yours. Your your quarterly. What'd you say? Virtual with quarterly in person. That works. Yeah. <laughs> hybrid is like they have to do both at the same time. Is what comes to mind there. Yeah. Well, as no it was right. Yep. All right. So how about this? Um, should we? Should we entertain a motion for and vote on the quarterly or primarily virtual with a quarterly in-person meeting? And then we're just voting on on one thing and we can see if that motion carries. Does that seem seem like a reasonable thing to vote on for, for folks? Yes. Yes. Okay. So so the motion is um the committee will hold meetings primarily virtually with in with an in with a quarterly in person meeting does that sound fine for a uh, for the motion to vote on yes okay will someone make that motion this is julie brecky i'll i'll make that motion okay thanks julie and do we have a second Second is Alex and Eric. Right, thank you, Alex. All right, so I will I will take the roll. So, um, so a yes vote would be for that. A no vote would be to not move to that. In which case, we we discuss something else. So, um, I guess Ashanti. Yes. All right, and I am a yes vote for that. Um, do we do we have anybody from the Minneapolis Building and Construction Trades Council, either Barry or Jenny? So no vote from them. No, they're not That's here. Not Jenny in the chat. Okay. All right. So I'm just gonna keep moving. Gilbert, how do you vote? You know, I 
I will probably um, say probably abstain at this point. Okay. Abstain. All right. Um, Marvin Smith. I vote yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Um, Sheila Olson. Yes. Thank you. Julie Brecky. Yes. Thank you. Tony O'Brien. Yes. Thank you. Alex Merritt. Yes. Thank you. Uh, do we have anyone from City of Minneapolis present? Either Leslie or Daniel? Let's see. No, we don't. Not today. Okay. Not a problem. And let's see. I think that is everybody of the members who are here. So it looks like we got one, two, three, four. Uh, Scott, this is John O'Fail, and I don't think yeah. you said my name, but I'll I'll go on. Oh, sorry, yes. that's okay. Great. I, I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to copy paste this this list from a from a PDF, and I may have uh, may have accidentally deleted a few folks. So hold on, let me make sure I screwed this up. So. This is Maura Brown. And you missed me also, so I'll oh, guess. I'm, I'm sorry, folks. Um, no worries. And yeah, see, this is the danger of cut and paste. And it looks like Kendra votes yes in the chat, and Krista. So, so. Sheila, Sheila copied from Minda. I work, sorry, could get myself off mute. Yes. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for bearing with the, this, it's always easier to do voting in person. <laughs> All right, is, I, I guess I will just say, is there anyone who I should have called to vote who I failed to call to vote? Right. So, seeing, hearing, hearing no more. Looks like the the motion carries. Um, we had all yes votes with a couple of abstentions. So, looks like that is our our plan moving forward. So, all right. I think we can go on to the next next slide here. So, slide forty four, please. So next week, we just wanted to have a little discussion about potential new members, and we need to identify another organization or agency that's able to provide an additional small business, that's able to provide additional small business expertise and resources to the committee. And in some past meetings, we've there were suggestions that we prioritize representatives from the trades with the most hours left on the project and other thoughts as well. So just wanted to open it up to, to discussion on that for potential new member organizations. And um, just to add a little bit more uh, context to that, um, <clears throat> one, specifically when we're talking about small business resources organizations, um, we're talking about a organization that would basically replace MEDA um, uh, and, and uh, organizations that work with uh, small businesses um, to provide support, resources, technical assistance, those sorts of things. And then um, also, um, this was in part of the ask um, to, to bring this to the chair. Um, he's, if we have recommendations, he's going to want to hear what those recommendations are. Um, I think uh, this committee is the best a resource to, to, to provide either um, organizations or names uh, for consideration. This is Maura, and I would propose Neighborhood Development Center as a potential replacement for MEDA in DC. 
Thank you, Laura. I don't know if this qualifies, but I just ran across it this week, but it, it, I'll throw it out there, but I know it's women, women owned, and I know they're DB qualified, but MN Best Inc., like Minnesota Best Inc., maybe the name of it? And you're talking about um, Young Kim? Yes. I'm not sure if it qual if she qualifies or not, or not. I just came across her, but she. yeah, that does make me think of um, Women Venture and also the African Development Corporation um, that is similar to NDC, but NDC was on my mind too, Maura. Yeah, I'm just writing this down. Another potential uh, would be MCCD, the Metropolitan Consortium of Community Developers. They do some small business support. I'm sorry, MCCD. MCCD. I'll write it in the chat. Yeah, they kind of work with all the community development corporations. Any others? Um, I think Scott mentioned this, that previously we talked about um, in terms of additional uh, trade unions, um, those that had, are contributing the most hours on the project. I think that's what we will go with unless someone has a specific uh, recommendation or uh, differing thought about uh, uh, upon that. Hey Ashanti, this is John. I just have a question. Do you know when that when the uh, that starts? When the um, I know we voted on having more union uh, unions at the table. Now is is there a date that like is it Jan June or something or? Well, the, the plan of action will be for us to reach out to, well, um, these will be the ones considered, and then we'd reach out um, to the uh, to the various organizations and to gauge their interest. Um, I wish I had a specific timeline, but um, I think June is realistic. Because yeah, it seems like the, with the unions that it'd be easier to pull them together. I know with the organizations, you have to find the right staff and person to make the monthly commitment. And mm -hmm. I also think uh, I just want to mention this to the to the team here that when we recruit new people, I think it's really important for us to consider why we're recruiting them and what is in it for them to uh, invest their time. Most of the people at the table are. Uh, uh, you know, we have uh, senior management, uh, directors, CEOs, uh, you know, lots of time put in uh, on this. And we want to make sure that when we call them that, you know, what, what do the, you know, what do they get out of it? Right. And, and what is their purpose of it? Um, I'm going to go back to uh, the nonprofits that Christy mentioned that, you know, uh, connecting with the subcontractors. Um, you know, we don't see that that much and we have a lot of nonprofits at the table, but we really don't, uh, we basically focus a lot on BSC yet there's other training organizations right here at the table. Um, I think it's really critical for us to, as members to decide 
why are we bringing somebody on and what are they going to get out of it that will both contribute to our project, but also be more fulfilling for that organization to take that precious time of theirs and invest it and have a say uh, on, on something. So, um, you know, that's just my opinion about this because um, I, I wonder about members at the table here um, if if when they started three, four, maybe even up to five years ago, if you did early planning, I was part of that with Barry and some others. Um, you know, how did we, uh, what was in it? Uh, what's in it for them? Uh, and why did we bring them on? And I'd also like to challenge this whole group, and I don't know if we really have time today, but when when is an appropriate time to leave where you leave and you leave in with, with respect to the to the group? Because this, or you know, we've never thought about this, but if five people left in the next month of these members, we'd be really scrambling hard, right? But if we knew that, you know what, I thought I was committing five years, three years, and now I'm committing six or seven, <laughs> you know, that, that's a bigger commitment, right? And it's like, well, how, how many of us want to stay on for five or six, seven years? I think we need to have discussions like this about membership. And then what are we going to get out of that membership to take take our take that precious time and really get something that that's healthy um so i i would challenge us to do that um i think this conversation is good and i think the organizations you picked out are good and i think you should pursue them but i think we don't really have a message because i a lot of us just came into this and we weren't sure what the full circle was um for me, it feels like it's been a real more advisory where I, I'm being told a lot. Of, it's like a report out, but there hasn't been a lot of report kind of best practice, best models that we've worked on. The BSC thing has been great. Um, you know, there's always good to great hear the good, great, great efforts that are going out. Um, but we all know uh, in the end, you know, I don't know if there's one organization that's moved more than a uh, one and a half percentage points uh, of contractors haven't raised their equity uh, more than one and a half percent. I've shared that with uh, you before. I'll share it with you again. Um, so we don't see a lot of equity going on, but I'd love to be able to know, okay, well, what are we getting out of it then? And when we call these organizations or these unions, what are they going to get out of it? And if we want the unions at the table, are we going to be able to ask them, like, has anybody called you last month? Because that's retention. You called somebody back. Now that second year apprentice maybe has a chance for a third year. Um, so I, I, I think I, I love what we're doing, but I don't know if we've dug well enough to see if people are getting uh, fulfillment, true fulfillment out of their time spent and what their commitment is. I'll, I'll leave it at that. It's a lot I said, I realize. I'll just jump in. I mean, I think that's a great point, John. I mean, I think and I think we should have that longer conversation about, you know, if there are folks who say, look, it's time for me to cycle out. Let's. I think we should put that on our agenda maybe for for next month so we can have some of those discussions because you know this project is now looking at several more years and i think that's fair and i think yeah as we're trying to bring community folks in i think i think you're right that folks are you know going to be motivated by feeling like they're having an impact and i think it's one thing to you know to be informed about a big project which i think is great and I do think we want to make sort of structural space for you know folks to share their expertise you know with you know both the government entities and with the contractors working on the project about hey we're doing this thing you know and this is working is this something you'll consider adopting is this something we can work into the system because i think you know people want to feel like they have impact and you know genuinely which i think is which i think is great and so yeah, I think we should. I think we should have that sort of set up in our conversations, and I think we we want to continue to push because I think, you know, I I would love to see this project finish with higher numbers than where we're at now, and I think clearly, you know, we know there are strategies that work, and there are strategies that have worked on other projects where we've seen, you know, gains over time, where projects that started you know started off doing okay managed to implement some you know, tailored solutions. And I know it's going to be different project to project, industry to industry, but there are things we can do that are going to increase impact. And I think having the right community partners at the table, you know, providing expertise on those probably makes that even more effective. So I think, 
as we make this pitch for others to join, I, I definitely think that that's a entirely. Yeah, I think those are definitely valid points and um, for sure from a council perspective, um, moving forward, one of the main things that we hope to get out of this is that <clears throat> we have other stuff coming. Uh, Blue line extension. Um, there's lots of BRT work going on, major capital programs coming up. And we do want to uh, benefit um, from the expertise that the panel members bring um, that will inform not only this project, but making these numbers go up, but also informing the other work that's coming down the pipe in the industry at whole, because um, if we're still having these same conversations, um, uh, once, once Blue Line and, and some of these other projects kick off, then yes, we've, we've, we, we've not, uh, reaped the benefits. And also with, with some of the, the funding for infrastructure and other things that are coming to our region, um, uh, we, we want to be prepared to implement to implement any um, ideas that come from this group um, and be able to back them with resources um, and other things. So if, if we are able to do those things, um, both um, have a focus and increase um, participation on this project, but also what are the lessons learned and what are the best practices that we can implement uh, moving down the line in the industry and on these other projects, then I think we will will be able to reap some of that that mutual benefit um, that John was mentioning uh, mentioning before. Uh, that's a good question. Um, and the question is, does Blue Line fold into this at one point, or will another Great Minds Committee overlap? And if so, will some community partners be asked to attend both? Um, I think that's an excellent question and, and a question that I've been um, and we've been mulling uh, internally here at the Council. Um, uh, because I think the, the Blue Line, uh, Gold Line, Purple Line, all of those are our projects um, and uh, we would probably be, be tapping a lot of, if not most or all of you here on this committee. Um, so the question is, does it make sense to, um, you know, a, as opposed to just a, a report out um, kind of a strategy uh, that, that really encompasses and, and looks at, you know, all of, all of the councils, what I would call major uh, capital projects, um, as opposed to focusing on one. Um, however, um, that, that's just kind of something that we've been kind of mulling and thinking about and really haven't had any um, definitive uh, conversations or, or decisions about, but I think it's valid to consider um, a different model or a model that's similar to, um, not exactly the same, but similar to uh, what MnDOT does um, and, and not just looking at one project, um, but uh, also looking at the other major projects. All right, any other comments um, or, or recommendations for, uh, for members? And I did uh, hear Scott's point that at some point we should put this on uh, as an agenda, my agenda item on one of our meetings. Um, so uh, we can look forward to that. I think we do have some things coming up uh, for May, um, including a final report out from Alice Black. I believe we're also going to have a presentation um, 
memory serves me correct, from John, and then um, escapes me what else, but um, we can add this um, as a discussion topic um, to an upcoming meeting. Yeah, John and MBHR are going to partner on that, that data. All right, um, I will bring these recommendations and um, we will contact um, folks to uh, gauge their interests and, and participation. Scott? All right, so now's the time of the agenda where we do public comment. Um, just as a reminder, if you wish to offer public comment at a virtual meeting in the future, you can email excuse me, public.info at metc.state.mn.us in advance of the meeting to register. My understanding is that we did not have anyone register who wished to comment today. So no, no commenters from the public um, for, for at this time. We did not receive any. All right. Um, gave back everybody a whopping five minutes. Um, I would like to um, say thank you for your participation. Um, it, it, uh, it, it doesn't go unappreciated and um, I definitely want to uh, make sure uh, that uh, it is worthwhile, um, but it is much appreciated. Um, our next meeting will be held on Thursday